Little dreamers, big dreamers, big dreamers, little dreamers. I'm singing. I'm singing because tonight I have a book about another amazing singer. One of my most favorites. In fact, the woman whose voice, when I heard her, then I started getting interested in music from uh, her era and, and these great singers like Judy Garland. Um, this Tonight's biography is about the legendary Miss Lena Horne. Um, just an incredible voice. Incredible voice, Lena Horne. Now here's the thing. Lena Horne and Judy Garland didn't get along uh, too well. I mean, they didn't fight or anything, but Lena didn't really like her that much uh, because um, Judy was sort of a last minute kind of chick. You know, she didn't really rehearse that much. She was kind of more like off the cuff. And Lena was very uh, disciplined in practice. So it's not, it wasn't like a big like war, like some of these Hollywood things, you know, like uh, like uh, Joan Crawford and Betty Davis or um, Olivia de Havilland and her sister, like that kind of stuff, you know. But Lena and Judy were not buddies. But anyway, this is, she's still a fantastic singer was. The Legendary Miss Lena Horne by Carol Boston Weatherford and art by Eliz Elizabeth Zunun. And if you haven't heard Lena's voice, you are missing out. So I'll put a link to her music. The Horn family tree was laden with achievers, teachers, activists, a Harlem Renaissance poet, the dean of a black college, and Lena's grandmother, Cora Cal Calhoun Horn, a college graduate. Lena's father, Teddy, had other ideas. A street hustler, he lived high on the hog. He had fine clothes and fancy cars, never went to jail, and eventually owned a hotel and restaurant. Lena's mother, Edna, was an actress in a touring troupe. The day Lena arrived, Teddy bet on a card game to pay the hospital bill. June 30th, 1917, Brooklyn. Native New Yorker Lena Horne was born into the freedom struggle. At two, she became not just one of the youngest members of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, but also a cover girl for the NAACP Branch Bulletin. When Lena was barely a toddler, Teddy left for Pittsburgh and turned his smarts to becoming a gambling kingpin. Her stage-struck mother hit the road too. Little Lena stayed with her grandmother, Cora, in the family's four-story Brooklyn townhome. Cora had high standards and drilled into Lena good manners, black pride, and the value of a well-rounded education. Lena learned to read before kindergarten. Books were her lifelong love, a haven from hardship and heartache. Cora enrolled Lena in drama and dance lessons, but would not hear of a show business career. Not for respectable folks, Cora said. Cora had high hopes for her granddaughter, but at a tender age, Lena got toted along as her mother chased bit parts in vaudeville. Lena lived out of a suitcase, shuttled between relatives, boarding houses, and homes that took in children for pay. Being on the road with her mother was rough, especially down south. Lena's shoes never fit, and her feet were always hurt because stores did not let blacks try on shoes before buying. A black cast member was lynched and a black guest was beaten at the, com at the rooming house where Lena and her mother were staying. Lena longed for home. And there's a quote here from an African-American spiritual sung by Lena. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child, a long way from home. Back under Cora's wing in Brooklyn, Lena attended an integrated all-girls school, one of the city's best and joined a debutante social club. During the Great Depression, Lena left school and moved in with her mother and new stepfather, both jobless. As money ran out and bread lines grew, Lena's mother decided to put her on stage. Lena auditioned at the fabled Cotton Club, Harlem's hottest night spot, had a valet parking with sizz sizzling black musical reviews, waltzing waiters, and no mingling between the black performers and the all-white audience. I had no talent, said Lena, 
All I had was looks. Just a team, Lena sashayed into the chorus line. Band leaders Duke Ellington and Cab Calloway were now her teachers. Edna chaperoned and Coach Lena was singing. Before long, Lena leapt from the chorus line to Broadway in Dance With Your Gods. Then came a singing and dancing gig with the Noble Sizzle Society Orchestra. Classy as they were, the black band still had to enter white ballrooms through the back door and could not stay at white hotels. For a place to sleep after shows, band members had to scout for black families willing to take in a few musicians for the night. With Sizzle, 18 years old, Lena cut her first record, I Take to You. Lena took to the spotlight so well that she was soon fronting an all-white big band one of the first black vocalists to do so. Touring with the Charlie Barnett Orchestra was far from glamorous though. Lena was banned from the bandstand because between numbers. Restaurants refused to serve her and hotels refused her rooms and she slept in the bus until Barnett got wise. He began introducing her as Cuban, but that didn't take the sting out of racism. When Lena headlined a nightclub out west, Hollywood studio executives caught her act. She had already starred in a couple of low-budget films, including The Duke is Tops. Now MGM was offering something more, a studio contract, the first ever for a black actress. But the NAACP wanted Lena not only to command a paycheck, but to demand respect. With the civil rights group behind her, Lena waged a one-woman war against stereotypes by refusing to play maids and mammies on screen. NAACP leaders hoped that Lena could change the way that whites saw African Americans. Respectable roles, though, were few and far between for black actresses, so Lena was cast instead in singing numbers that could easily be snipped from films when shown in the South so as not to defy racist views. Lena dubbed herself a butterfly pinned to a column. She did get to fly in black films like Cabin in the Sky and Stormy Weather, whose title song became her anthem. Even in black and white movies, this butterfly dazzled. Lest Lena be mistaken on screen for white, Max Factor created makeup just to darken her skin. Then she lost roles to white actresses who wore her makeup to play light-skinned black women. Black moviegoers didn't have it any better than Lena. Southern theaters that didn't let her, that didn't bar blacks made them use a colored entrance, sit in the balcony, or wait for midnight screenings. Although Lena despised Jim Crow laws, she did her part for the war effort, singing on armed forces radio shows. But even the military was segregated, just as there were separate bathrooms, water fountains, and waiting rooms in the South. There were separate shows, one for black troops and another for whites. At one venue, Lena was denied a cup of coffee, but was asked for an autograph on her way out. At another, German prisoners of war were seated in front of black soldiers. That indignity was too much for Lena to swallow. She was fed up with whites only clubs and theaters. <clears throat> so she paid her own way to perform for black troops. She paid many visits to the base in Alabama where the famed Tuskegee Airmen were training to become the first black military aviators. After World War II, Lena's ties to outspoken activists like entertainer Paul Robeson and civil rights leader W.E.B. Du Bois got her blacklisted. Though not a communist, she couldn't get work in Hollywood, not during Senator Joe McCarthy's Red Scare. She sang at President Truman inaugural ball just the same. By then, Lena had married and divorced and had two children to feed. She had to work. You got babies, singer Billy Holiday once told her. You got to pay your rent. Like Cora said, never let anyone see you cry. Lena kept her tears and her love life to herself. In 1947, she married Lenny Hayton, a white music director for MGM. 
They married in Paris, France, because many states in the U.S. did not allow interracial marriage. Lena and Lenny did not announce their marriage for three years. She later said that she married him to advance her career, but that she learned to love him. With Lenny at her side, Lena toured nightclubs and became an international star. In 1957, her name was off the blacklist and Lena cut records, sang on TV, and starred on Broadway. But her most important work lay ahead. At a 1963 rally with Mississippi civil rights leader Medgar Evers, Lena sang the spiritual, This Little Light of Mine. She found not just her voice, but a calling, her light. Days later, Evers was slain. Down but unbowed, Lena drew on her freedom-fighting roots. She took time off from stage and screen to join the civil rights movement. She sang at rallies for the National Council of Negro Women. At the March on Washington, where Dr. King gave his famous I Have a Dream speech, Lena spoke one word into the microphone, freedom. In this battle, Lena was not just a pretty face, she was a foot soldier. Eventually, the star returned to the silver screen as Glinda the Good Witch in The Wiz and to Broadway in an award-winning one-woman show. Lena even sang on Sesame Street to a certain green frog. And I'll put the link in for that too. It's quite lovely. I will also put the link in where she sings with Grover. That is really cool. It wasn't easy being an Ebony Queen. Lena's life was not without sad notes. In 1967, she lost her dearest friend, composer and pianist Billy Strayhorn. And in 1971, she lost her father, her son, and husband all in the same year. Lena was so down that the only way she could go was up. She stayed in and lost herself in books. Then music saved her. Lena remembered what band leader Count Basie, jazz royalty himself, told her years earlier. They don't give us a chance very often. And when they do, we have to take it. Lena seized every opportunity to shine. Her crown silvery gray, Lena kept cutting records and winning praise, Grammy and Tony Awards, a Kennedy Center honor, honorary degrees from Howard University and Yale, and a place in the big band and jazz hall of fame. Lena Horne's pioneering performances her fight on the front lines for the freedom struggle and the racial barriers that she broke and her fiery pride form her legacy because Lena refused to darken rear doors. Black stars now gleam on red carpets and reap box office gold. Lena Horne, pretty incredible, incredible lady. Faced a lot of odds and paved the way for so many. My friends, <clears throat> thank you again for yet another beautiful day of serving as one of your librarians in your library. I don't even know if I said it. My name is Miss Ng, and this is the Shayla North Hills Library. And I thank you. Kiss your beautiful brains. Kiss your loving hearts. Look in that mirror. Look in the mirror. And say, hey, good looking. Because you're all good looking, just the way you are. Thank you.